Philosophy Society. Uh, thank you all for taking the time out to come uh, attend this uh, debate this evening. Um, here at the Philosophy Society, we believe that ideas are, uh, and philosophies are fundamental to how a society functions and governs itself. Uh, we believe that ideas need to be discussed and examined as to ascertain their credibility as these ideas fundamentally form the nucleus of what a civilization is based upon. Um, and uh, obviously, secularism and Sharia being such a topical issue, especially in light of what's happening in the Middle East these days, um, the debate tonight seems even more pertinent. So I'm not going to talk too much, as uh, I'm not a very good speaker. So I will introduce our speakers tonight. We have, firstly, uh, to my near right, we have uh, Mr. Lincoln Allison, who is an emeritus reader in politics at Warwick, uh, at Warwick University. He's a visiting professor in sport and leisure at Brighton. Uh, he's also a doctor of letters, and his latest book is The Disrespect Agenda, How the Wrong Kind of Niceness is Making Us Weak and Unhappy. So, uh, very honoured to have him with us today. Uh, the second speaker is Mr. Jamal Dean, who is a graduate in economics. He's a former contributing editor to New Civilization magazine and commentator on Islamic affairs. He regularly appears on TV and radio programmes and has participated and delivered talks and lectures uh, up and down the country. So, uh, just to go through the format today, we're going to have uh, 15 minutes for each speaker to put forward their case. We'll then have a five minute rebuttal from each speaker. We'll then have a cross-examination section where each speaker can ask three questions to the other speaker and we'll have a bit of back and forth. That should be exciting. And then we'll move on to the Q&A section and then a five minute uh, final thoughts from each of our speakers. So uh, I'll hand it over to Mr. Jamal Dean for his 15 minutes. Uh, I begin in the name of Allah, Rahman Rahim, as is common for all Islamic gatherings. And I also greet you with the Islamic gathering greeting of uh, peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And warm welcome to all non Muslims in attendance in this evening's event. To start, uh, to address the issue of the Shia, I'd like to give an example of my own personal experience. Um, and this relates to a friend of mine, actually, who lives in my area, and I often go to visit him. However, when I go to see him at his shop, or when I walk past his shop, I often will not enter or go in to greet him and discuss with him, because actually it takes quite a lot of effort to make that uh, type of visit. The reason why is my friend has a jewellery shop. And because he has a jewellery shop, and because of the need to protect his jewellery shop, the need to deal with the environment in which we live, he has a set of two, two doors, two automated doors. Effectively, you have like an airlock situation. So if you want to go in and say hi, have a quick chat, you're going to have to go through two sets of doors to reach it. One door will open, you step through the first door, that one closes behind you. Then the second door opens, you step through that door and then that one closes behind you as well. The reason being is because there's a certain environment, there are certain values that are dominant in the society. And that leads to a feeling of insecurity and it leads to a fear of crime. This is a reality that's resulted from the fact the values that are prevalent in this society. If I contrast that to a visit that I made a few years ago to Mecca, to Saudi Arabia, and which I went through the same experience actually, or a very similar experience, which is I wanted to go and see a jewelry shop. In fact, I happened to just be walking past a jewelry, jewelry shop, and I saw the owner of the shop. We briefly uh, caught each other's eyes, and obviously as a jewelry shop owner, in these circumstances, he waved me into the shop. There were no airlocks to walk through. In fact, I could see all the jewelry from the middle of the street. All I needed to do was step into the door, which there isn't actually a door on his, his, his shop, just a simple uh, border that he pulls down. And he hands me some of the jewelry from the shop. Which one would you like to look at? Which item would you like to examine? So I thought, well, I don't really get the experience to do this very often, just walk in off the street or still be standing in the street and someone hand me an item of expensive jewelry. So I looked at the fattest, biggest bracelet I could see and I asked him to pass it to me. So I'm looking at this bracelet, I asked him to weigh it, valued at 1,200 pounds. 
So I'm standing in the middle of the road holding this expensive bracelet. He's not concerned that I'm going to run off. He's not concerned about what actions I will do. And I am able to look at this, evaluate it, give it back to him. Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you, and then go on my way. The reality is there are a set of values that are prevalent in that society. And that contributes to an atmosphere of safety and security. And today's discussion will be about secularism and Sharia. And I will be putting forward the case that when we look to the Islamic model, when we look to the Sharia, we are discussing a positive set of values that address how people will live together, the values that mold the society, that atmosphere of piety that actually brings about a safe environment, that actually brings about a cohesive society. At the same time, it has a system that actually protects the rights and duties of the citizens. And in contrast to this, we have the secular system, which I'll go to address in a few moments. So first of all, we see that this term Sharia is uh, something that you could say, as, as uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, he said, the term Sharia has an almost instinctive, fearful impact. I.e., today's environment, today's climate, this is a term that invokes fear. It evokes fear. And in the discussion that we see today about the Middle East, especially with the turmoil taking place in, in, in uh, Egypt, in Tunisia, we see that this discussion has talked about the dangers of the Sharia, the dangers of Islam the dangers of the political model that Islam puts forward. So it's about addressing what are those so-called dangers, or what are those misconceptions of the system that Islam puts forward. <coughs> so first of all, in addressing this issue, I'd like to say that we should understand that Islam comes as a system of life. It's not just a religious code, not just a spiritual code, i.e. just related to the worships, just related to uh, the, the rituals. But actually, it governs all aspects of life. And when it does so, it gives comprehensive solutions for all of those areas. It's not something where, when we talk about ruling by Sharia, effectively what you're saying is you walk into the court and the judge will measure your, measure your beard, or he'll see how white the garments you're wearing, or how black, depending on man or woman, and he'll decide, okay, well, your beard is far longer than his, so you're obviously innocent, he's guilty. <laughs> Yeah, or, you know, in this case, I obviously have to award it to you because, look, you look more pious. Yeah? So, it's not a case where we say, because of the relig religiosity of a person, this would be the basis upon which the system will look at the citizens. Actually, when we look to the Islamic ruling system, when we look to the Islamic economic system, it provides solutions for all of the society. And it does so with a system that guarantees certain basic rights, what we will call in Islamic terminology, the maqasid of the sharia i.e. that it lays down uh, systems and laws that guarantee that every citizen, uh, man or woman, every citizen, Muslim or non-Muslim, would be able to obtain basic education for free, would be able to achieve their economic rights, would be able to live in a society that provides protection as well. So when we look to the Islamic system, we are not talking about one where it's governed effectively by a spiritual bias or just by someone following their own emotional sway of what's right and what's wrong, what's moral or what's immoral. But rather the Islamic system, as well as giving a basis for piety, a relationship with the Creator, built on that is a system that solves the problems of society, for the Muslim and for the non-Muslim. In regards to this issue, obviously there are many controversial aspects about the Islamic Sharia, the, the rulings of the Islamic Sharia, which I'm sure we'll get time to explore in more detail through the Q&A session. Just to comment briefly on some of the elements that may uh, be seen as very uh, backward or barbaric, and I think that's something that needs to be addressed. First of all, when we look to the actual Sharia rulings on issues like the punishment system, so for example, the punishment for theft, or the fact that there is capital punishment in the Islamic system. And these rules are often seen as very barbaric. But we have to understand that there is a basis upon which Islam puts these rules forward and a context within, within which they exist. The first element is that you have a society which has uh, broad positive values. So it encourages an atmosphere where one is accountable to God. That each person, he feels a sense that there is more to life than the pursuit of benefits. Yeah, that the whole objective in life is actually something that's quite transcendent and uplifting. So from this basis, you find a society, first of all, the values that it addresses are harmonious values. They're values that bring people together. They enable society to function. 
Second of all, alongside these punishments and alongside the uh, economic uh, solutions that are put forth from the Islamic system, we also find that it's not an arbitrary system. That because you've been accused of theft or you've been accused of murder or any other accusation, that the harshest punishment possible will be sought as soon as possible. So you know, the, 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 the idea that you have a Qadi who's you know, a judge who's sitting under a palm tree and he's just waiting, longing for the opportunity to cut a hand. Or to, you know, as soon as he can, whoever he can, he's going to be lashed at the earliest opportunity. This is actually far from the Islamic system. And what we actually find is, historically, the Islamic model was one of the first systems in the world to put forward the concept of innocent until proven guilty. We find it's one of the most basic principles of Islamic jurisprudence, actually. And just to give an example, without going into too much detail, we have a book uh, by a very prominent writer, Jalaluddin Asimuti, a very prominent scholar, in which he elaborates that the rejection of implementation of hudud in cases of doubt is one of the first basic principles of Islamic jurisprudence. I, in his book, he puts it as principle number six. So this is how important the idea of innocent until proven guilty and not actually judging someone on the basis of doubt. So the idea of beyond reasonable doubt, actually for the, from the Sharia perspective, there should be no doubt whatsoever before the implementation of the most severe punishments. So, in effect, in sum, you have a Sharia-based model which deals with the rights of the people in society. It provides a positive set of values for the society. And likewise, it actually brings harsh punishment as a deterrent. Not as an everyday action, but as a maximal level of punishment for the most se severe and serious cases. Contrasting that to the Western model, or to the secular model. Now, as I said, when, it looks, when we look to the issue of the role of men and women in the Islamic society, we find this is something heavily criticized. When we look to the Islamic punishment system or the Islamic ruling system, these are issues which are heavily criticized in the media and in the Western society. And to address these points very briefly, the first important point we have to understand is when one accepts a secular model and one accepts that man will be the source of legislation, Effectively, you're saying that any ruling or any solution is open to debate and discussion. So as much as the Sharia is targeted for criticism, the rulings that we discuss are targeted, or the rulings that the Muslims believe in are targeted as barbaric or backward. Effectively, someone who believes in a secular system has to accept that if negotiation, if discussion takes place, those self-same barbaric rules can become accepted championed, condoned in society. They can become the ruling system. Because 